Hello everybody. Okay. Ishan is here already. Hi. 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 Okay, so let me just introduce you for our viewers. Ishan Khosla is a Delhi-based visual artist, designer, and researcher. He has a master's in fine arts from uh, the design uh, in, in design uh, from the School of Visual Arts in New York. And um, he started Ishan Khosla Design, which is his own firm. Um, and um, so, hi, hi, Ishan. How are you doing? Hi, hi. Uh, good, good. Thank you. How are you okay. handling the situation right now? <laughs> oh. Crazy. Oh, you know, when it started, I was actually stuck in France, but now I'm back home. So I'm much better now. What about you? Yeah, uh, managing somehow. It's not easy, obviously, for anyone, but uh, managing, taking it a day at a time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. Let me just start off with, you went to um, America, right? To, um, you were studying computer science first. That's right. Right? You did your bachelor's in computer science. So what made you look into design as a career? So actually, I had a crazy experience when I was studying computer science. I um, actually had a kind of blindness, like temporary blindness happened to me, um, which happened because of a cyst in my brain, near my brain actually, pituitary gland. Oh, wow. And it basically pu pushed on the optic nerves. And so my uh, vision was affected. So for about, I would say two weeks, I was uh, kind of legally blind. I was not 100% blind, but I had to go, so, go through surgery and that whole process uh, of going through this trauma and coming back and then getting more, I mean, not all my sight is back, but most of it is back. Enough for me to be a designer, I guess. So I became basically very interested in visual arts after that. I mean, I was already interested in visual arts before, but I was still pursuing computer science. But then after this experience, I realized that, no, I, I have to do something in the visual arts. So that's how I kind of started looking at photography and then graphic design and, uh, you know, basically visual arts. I got into that. Wow. That's a, that's a crazy story. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so uh, after after you did your master's in design, right, you worked in the U.S. for about, I think, 10 years. So how was that? For you? Yeah, I was there for a total about of 12 years. So I didn't work uh, 10 years. I worked about maybe four to five years. Uh, the rest oh. of it was education. Yeah. Um, how okay. was the experience? That's, is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was great. Uh, the work culture in the U.S. is very different from India. I think that's the main difference I noticed. And uh, I think what I'm also what I also noticed is how interns and employees work there versus here. I mean, there are pros and cons in both cultures, but but how people work here is very different from there. I feel um, one of the things I can share is that I noticed that people in general in, in the offices I worked at. Uh, take a lot of ownership of the project, which I find really great, like in the US. But in India, I feel that uh, whatever reason, interns and, and employees, they are always, like I feel in my experience, not taking full ownership, like as though it's their project, they feel that, oh, it's a studio project. And it will be a portfolio piece for me and I'll do something and I'll, uh, at least even if I don't finish the project, like if I'm part of that project, and then I leave the studio or whatever, move on, I'll have it as a portfolio piece. But there, I think, I feel that there's a more commitment in terms of finishing a project that you've started uh, before you move on. So that's one cultural difference I noticed, of course. Um, yeah. Okay, so like when it comes to design, would you say there is a difference in how America or like the Western world views design and how India views design? Well, I can't, I won't say I can generalize West versus or America versus India, uh, how people view design. Um, it's very different sensibility. Um, yeah, and also it really depends on the age group you're talking about. And, you know, so I can't yeah. generalize, but what I can share um, is, um, you know, of course, I, I feel that in India, we, 
um, although we are, I think, are doing some amazing stuff in terms of design, I feel more has to be done. I'm talking about graphic design in terms of looking at our own culture more deeply um, than I think than we are doing right now. Whereas I feel in the West, I mean, I guess it's a more established field. It's been there longer in the sense in terms of graphic design. So there is an entrenched sensibility already part of their, uh, uh, you know, part of the, I guess, uh, the field, the genre. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of mentors, you know, there are a few generations of mentors who are also involved in education. Of course, that's true in India too. But I feel like uh, we are, overall, we are very influenced by uh, design from outside India rather than within India, uh, or even looking at other aspects of culture in India bringing that into our design sensibility uh -huh. yeah i agree with you and um so but it's changing, uh, coming right? back to yeah, yeah it, it is changing it's definitely yeah. changing like even i am experiencing it as as a student at nid like there's a lot of indian influence that's coming in and it's really great to see yeah um and also the new the nuanced indian i think indian earlier used to be considered as Kish and Bollywood and the typical uh -huh. full color Indian, but now I think there's a more nuanced aspect of India, which Indians themselves are discovering, designers uh, and artists are discovering. So I think that's more interesting and exciting when you get into the subculture and you know that kind of nuanced sophistication. That's what I'm hoping, mm -hmm. uh, like looking forward to seeing more of that in the future. Okay, so um, I would say a big part of India's identity comes from, you know, its crafts and all. And we're very, and now we come to um, the Thai Craft Initiative, which is something which you started. And yes. uh, so, for our viewers, the, what is Type Craft Initiative? Yes, so Type Craft, uh, in a nutshell, is just about making a typeface from a craft, from a, right now, from an Indian handmade craft or a tribal art. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, the goal really is one is to uh, provide livelihood to the people we work with, to the craftspeople we work with. But the other is also to, uh, I mean, there are various other goals, such as how do we uh, challenge, uh, you know, type design, graphic design, what, what are the boundaries of functionality in a way, because uh, some of these uh, fonts are very heavy with nodes and very intricate and ornamental. And of course, they're all display fonts. I should clarify that this is not a text typeface. So um, so that's one other aspect. And the third aspect I would say is how do we make, uh, you know, this, this uh, combination of design and craft interesting both for design students um, who I've taught, uh, basically we've done type craft workshops where design students look at a craft and deconstruct that craft, look at the lexicon and the language and the motives of their craft and kind of figure out how can you make letters from that. And then the flip side of that is when we work with craftspeople, how do you make them think in terms of design? So they're already very familiar with their own craft lexicon and hand making, but how do you, how do you get them to think in terms of uh, new forms? So taking their, their existing crafts and making them into letters. So making a letter is not just, um, it's not just done because it's cool and it's functional, but there is a challenge by transforming your motif, like your peacock motifs and your regular motifs that you're used to into something totally alien to you, to what you're used to doing, that throws up another challenge. And I think the end result is that it's, it's also another way of looking at craft, not as a decorative object or a cushion cover or something like that, but something functional, like a font is a starting point. It's not a mug with a craft stamped onto it. Um, it is something that is you know, anyone can use and create artworks or communication from it. So I think that is an important aspect is the tool that we're creating a tool, a functional tool. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. clarifies type craft. <laughs> no, like I get it. A typeface is like really versatile. You can use it anywhere, like anywhere in the world. You can just pick up that typeface and use it, right? Yes, that's right. So. That's how how exactly did this idea come about of you know taking different crafts and then maybe making a typeface out of it? How did you think about it? 
So actually, when I was doing my thesis project in the US way back in 2004, 2005, um, my thesis was looking at design education in India. Um, and I was trying to create a brand identity. So not only did I have to design a curriculum, but I also had to come up with uh, uh, like an identity uh, for the school. And so one of the things I was already exploring at that time was how can we use something from India and make it into typography, not fonts at that time. It was just about type, type. Uh, I guess, typography. Like I was using jalebis and I was using Laheria uh, to create uh, different words, you know, uh, like mm -hmm. design or other things. That design is intrinsic to Indian culture. It's not something that has come from outside, uh, even though the kind of design we do now is, is influenced by, uh, you know, Western principles. Yeah. But there is an intrinsic nature. And that's what I was trying to highlight through the, uh, thesis but to answer your question it took me quite a few years I mean I think in 2011 is when I worked on this project called Sangam in Kutch, Gujarat where um, actually um, I was approached by an Australian organization to create a logo design for a craft and design uh, conference and instead of working in our studio uh, I said why don't we go down to a, a village or to a place where a lot of crafts are happening and we actually collaborate with a craftsperson uh, because it was a conference on craft and design. So that's what we did. And uh, basically the outcome was that it was a logo, but it was just a one-off, right? And I felt that how can we do something that is more cyclical in nature? So with a font, what happens is that one is that you have workshops, you have much more longer engagement with the community. And secondly, uh, we also, through the sales of the fonts, royalties can go back to that community. So it's not like, okay, you know, one-off commission and then you're done and you never interact with them. Here, there is a more, I think, partnership and stakeholdership uh, involved. Mm, so that's, which lasts that's, for a longer time. Yes, that's right. And more okay. people can use so, it and learn about yeah. the craft. I just oh, wanted definitely. to add, yeah, because with the logo, okay, you see a logo, you can't use a logo, right? You, you can appreciate a logo or a brand identity, but with a, with a font, you can actually use it and engage with it. Mm -hmm. um, so within this type craft initiative, so far you've used a lot of different crafts like Chitra and Kodna. That's right. So how, how did you uh, select? these crafts like how did you decide which crafts to work on yeah so some of the crafts uh, i selected based on just chance encounters like meeting a certain person like one of the craftswomen radha sunur who we involved with chitara i met her uh, somewhere and i really liked the work and i didn't know about chitara so i thought that okay we could engage with her and then um, even with godna i actually met ram keli who was one of the uh, tribal tattoo artists who we work with, the Godarans, uh, at Suraj Kun Mela. And actually I found out that, uh, you know, both these crafts are languishing. Like there are very few people working in it. And tattoos are pretty much over now. They're not really applied on skin, at least in that area of Chhattisgarh where she works. Uh, and same with Chitara, there are only four or five families that are doing it. So I figured that it would also be nice to work with crafts that are about to vanish and disappear um, as a way to, you know, kind of, transform them into a new avatar before they just totally disappear. So, yeah. so something like the Godna tattoo craft, the, ta the art of tattooing, yeah. it's not, I mean, it's not something which you would think of when you think of a typeface. So what were the challenges which you faced in converting something like a tattoo into a typeface? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there were a lot of challenges. One was, of course, um, working with the group. So we always work in such a way that the crafts people or the tribal artists in this case are actually involved in making the letters. And so it's not a top-down approach. It's, it's very collaborative in nature. We, of course, are facilitators. We give guidance in terms of, uh, you know, type structure and cap heights and thicknesses and proportions, but they do the drawings. So one is how do you go from tattoos or anything in fact to letters. Um, the other is the technical aspect of when you come, come on to uh, like a font software like glyphs because these each each glyph actually has 5,000 nodes in the case of Godna. 
whereas in a typical latin script a if you take any letter it would have maybe 20 to 30 notes so it's a yeah. very heavy file so there are many challenges like that um, and i mean it's it's a longer explanation but basically it's it was a three week engagement and a lot of back and forth a lot of experimentation and over time actually now godna was started in 2013 or 14 Uh, was when we started that whole workshop process i think in the last 5 6 years we've really come a long way in terms of how we work with crafts people um, that whole engagement becomes uh, i feel more enriching for them as well so uh, yeah i don't know if i answered okay so <laughs> did i answer uh, <laughs> you you don't want to worry about that. uh so um, you talk about how the crafts people themselves are involved in creating the letter forms right as such that's right so um are you using just latin script are you using any indic scripts you know what what is that situation yeah so uh we also have worked with pakko uh, embroidery from uh, kutch where we have done it in gujarati so that is one of the indic scripts and we are hoping to do more indic scripts going forward but as you can imagine uh you know because it is a high number of nodes in a letter because of the intricacy if with indic scripts having many more glyphs than a latin script the font becomes heavier so that's one of the challenges we have to keep in mind uh -huh. when working with indic scripts okay yeah. the other aspect um, i should also add is for indic scripts mm -hmm. the audience is much less right so uh, of course it's important mm -hmm. to do indic scripts but how do we you know most of these projects are either self funded or funded by uh, you know organizations but with very base funding just to cover our costs so that becomes an issue like how do we make the most uh, out of that font and even get back to the crops people um, so that's a challenge in deciding whether we should work with a latin script or an indic script uh, but definitely we would like to do many more indic scripts going forward okay that's good to hear um so we uh, have been taught a sort of you know western influence design but then these uh, the crafts people right they have their own version of design which has been practiced in their culture for thousands and thousands of years so how was your experience working with them did you learn anything like was there exchange of knowledge things like that going on of course i mean it's always a learning experience for us i mean it's a mutual both ways i think we both learn a lot about each other and uh, the crafts and you know uh, they probably learn a little bit about design and how to transform the craft into something else i think what uh, i mean one of the things um, i mean uh, there are a lot of things that i learned but i think one of the things i realized is how difficult and how intricate the crafts are especially when you look at some of the embroideries like gabardi and so the other ones uh, they're so complicated and also the nuances there a lot of meanings that are embedded uh, you know with the embroideries or with the tattoos that relate to that community or that tribe um so those are certain things which as an outsider earlier i did not know about those kind of details right um, about it's almost like a tattoo is almost like a, a logo in a way right it identifies a person or a community in this case so it's 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 like a pictogram in a way and it's it's you know that community or that group understands what that means but from an outsider you don't really know so i i found a lot of interesting learnings not only directly from the crafts people but also in this whole process of working in uh, you know with motifs and tattoos the connection between how languages have also evolved is interesting to think about through the type graph initiative Mm, like starting from pictures and moving on to slowly evolving into letters and stuff like that. That's right. I mean, yeah. like the Godna tattoos, they say originated. I mean, a lot of the uh, in Madhya Pradesh, the Bimbetka caves, they have a lot of these pictograms, right? So they uh -huh. they they feel that a lot of them have come from them, which are about ten to twenty thousand years old, mm -hmm. going from pictograms to tattoos, and then from tattoos to eventually into graphemes. um and letters right like alphabets so i mean i think that transition in a way is happening through the type craft initiative as well uh not intentional but it just happened like that 
uh, so that was that's interesting and i think also what's interesting is that how the meaning is changing like the tattoo itself has a certain meaning like there's a bichu tattoo which is tattooed in uh, the back uh, the top part of the mm -hmm. back uh, to kind of it's a cure it's basically to prevent you from uh, uh, you know getting poisoned by a, a scorpion um, or to reduce the pain of the scorpion so uh, that has been now transformed into a letter which has no context to the original meaning so there's a whole transformation happening there so that's also interesting um, you know in its own sense how this yeah, that's fascinating so um is there i'm sure there must be some incidents which happened to you while working with these craft people which you uh, won't be able to forget so would you mind sharing something with us Anything? yeah i think one of the incidents i can definitely share is um, you know and this this is a this was a very tough one is like when we were working with the rabadi community in kach uh so usually the workshops happen at the place where the crafts people live or in that area in the village um we had asked before leaving delhi whether uh, they knew how to draw because at that stage a lot of the process involved drawing now we have evolved and i can talk about that in a separate uh, point later um now we have evolved to paper and other means to involve crafts people who can't draw but at that stage uh, when we did the rabadi workshop we we asked uh, the group you we were working with and they said yeah they can draw but they were not sh sure how well they could draw but when we arrived uh, on day 1 we realized that they didn't know drawing at all because you know, <laughs> there no bharat kaam like embroidery work but that takes so long yeah. and uh, you know when you're exploring forms and motifs and designs you need to do it faster and because these workshops are only for a week or two weeks and so that kind of just threw a spanner in the works and that's what happens with these workshops a lot of times you have to kind of be really uh, spontaneous think on the fly and sort out problems and issues which you may not have thought of you know the thing is that we're all myself and my team we're all graphic designers we're not textile designers or we're not designers in the different genres we are working in so that makes it even more challenging right um, so we are not experts in the craft we are, we are novices so I so mean, how did you overcome yeah. that problem yeah, how did so you how overcome we, that problem? yeah in the case of rabadi uh, how we overcame the problem was that we actually had to look at luckily they have a huge archive uh, at the, the place at kalaraksha where we were working in uh, kutch of rabadi uh, garments and ornaments and clothes etc and plus in the village there was a lot of this uh, mud work lipai ka kaam which is done by the community so we actually had to spend a day or two just looking at all sorts of embroideries and uh, you know their work and then decipher from those uh, i would say motifs and icons into letter forms whatever kind of looks like a letter or we can get you know a form of an a or a w um, we we had to kind of work that way and and, and then engage with the crafts people like that so that was the so that process was it like you see some existing patterns and then you try to you know create a letter form out of it or do you create a letter form from scratch and then try and fill the pattern into it or how did you go about that you're talking about rabadi or you in general you are asking about in general i would say so in general it depends uh, like in barmer we we just went to barmer in february working on barmer applique so there uh, we actually worked with paper cut like we had uh, the women there the craft women cut paper and they never done that before and in fact we found mm -hmm. out that a lot of the times they are just doing the stitching work they're not working in the design of the whatever motif they're already doing they've been it's been given to them and they're just implementing it so here it was a huge challenge for them but they were also i think the whole workshop was covered with cut paper it was amazing to see <laughs> the images uh, initially we used newspaper but then we used colored paper so the whole place and their children also came it was like a whole party that was happening uh, of letters you know so there were just letters everywhere in the whole place they were just cutting 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 so we just kept them kept making them work on different letters you know kept challenging them and some of them couldn't make letters right some of them said mere se nahi hota you know in the beginning they would just make simple stars and motifs 
So um, I guess it's case to case. In, in, uh, it depends in each group. It depends how exposed that group is, and also what is the craft medium? Is it embroidery or is it a draw? Like is it like Madhubani or uh, Godna, which is drawn? Um, so you know, depending on the medium and the process it's rendered, uh, that changes the way we we interact with the craftspeople. Yeah. Okay, so something like uh, Badmer applique. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, to make one letter, um, you know, how much time would it? How much time would it take? Yeah. So it's so what you're seeing behind me, the Z is Badmer applique. Um, oh, that's and, yeah, and so that was the outcome of a two-week workshop. Uh, but in the first uh, four to five days. all everyone was doing was cutting paper right and then we were looking at the artwork that the women were doing like the paper cuts initially they were as i said some of them struggled with making letters some of them could make letters some couldn't but over time they could and then some of them were really good at making you know very intricate designs and so what we did was we took the different motifs and you know sometimes we would work on it but sometimes some of the more advanced craftswomen we asked them to also design we are we said okay these are the motifs that these women have made can you now make a z and of course we had to create an okay. outline of the letter just by pencil we you know just so that they know what are the proportions um so we always do it by pencil we don't like take a font or something like that because one is that we want mm-hmm. it to be unique and the other is we do have to have some sense of proportion and thickness um so that it looks like a font family but apart from giving them the outline so in this case an outline was given and they had to figure out how to fill that in but in the case of godna no such thing was done in the case of godna we first asked them to draw letters totally raw on their own like from their tattoos and motifs so they looked very disproportionate initially and then all we did was we said okay now can you uh, constrain your letters to a certain cap height certain thicknesses uh-huh. you know so we we defined those for them we helped them define that but then they did the drawing so it's a very different process you know for every craft and that's why it's so challenging actually <laughs> these workshops are extremely challenging not not an easy thing to do <laughs> mm-hmm. but it's fun <laughs> so um, what are some of the crafts which you are working on right now like at the moment so we are working to finish uh, some of the ones we've already worked with so soof embroidery uh, barmer uh, rabadi dibri rabadi actually and then uh, there's pakko these are the ones we are we have already finished all the workshops and uh, scanning and vectorization we are in the process of the you know the type design and type development process uh, at this stage of these four and we are hoping to do now another one uh, this year now it depends on the whole situation uh mm-hmm. with the covid and all that but um unfortunately yeah so i don't know how we'll do a workshop so th- that's the next thing i mean we are hoping to start another typeface in september or october uh let's see fingers crossed let's see how that goes uh, so that's and yeah, probably we will be doing it in an index script this time oh cool okay yeah. And uh, once these typefaces are done, where can we find them? If you, if uh, you typecraftinitiative dot org, we sell them on the okay. website. Yeah. And um, how has this initiative affected the craftspeople themselves, their livelihoods, and uh, you know how yeah. has it affected them? I would say uh, there some are directly and some are more indirect. So I think some uh, one of the things I'm uh, when we were in Barmer. we noticed was um, you know some of the girl uh, children there were not going to school uh, but this whole workshop happened and actually they had gone to school earlier but for some reason maybe financial or i don't know what reason but they had stopped them from going to school but because they had been to school they were they could actually figure out the letters very quickly they knew this was a a b <laughs> so that was really exciting to see and i think the uh, their mothers realized the value and because we were doing this whole two week workshop on letters um and uh, you know letters is also very li- uh, related to literacy as well obviously and education mm-hmm. and so i think it was amazing to see how you know they sent them back to school and uh, i think that was very heartening to see that uh, on the third or fourth day 
we noticed that uh, Pooja was one of the girls who was there. Uh, she started going back to school, and that was really nice to see. And I think so. I mean, sometimes uh, the outcome is very intangible and uh, subtle, and sometimes it's more uh, tangible. Like some two of the women we worked with said that they want to now learn the alphabet. They want to know how to read and write. They said, "Our children are studying. I also want to study. Like you know, my." Daughter is also learning, and I want to learn. So that was nice. Um, in some cases, like with Godna, I think they benefited from the uh, monetary uh, value in the sense that they said that uh, whatever they earned in the workshop will keep them sustained for four to five months in the village. Um, so oh. that was a more monetary direct impact. Here with Barmer, it was more about education and learning, and also they really appreciated the whole. uh transformation you know because they are usually as i said not involved in uh, all these processes so we involve them in all the processes involved in in making an applique cutting and you know uh, the stitching part and that what is known as tinching where you make holes so all sorts of things mm-hmm. so i think that was a it was like a skill development which they also really enjoyed so it depends again case to case and uh, speaking of crafts uh, you also work on an identity for kutch that's right right yeah could you tell us a little bit about that how it came about and what was it for yeah so that was uh, an interesting uh, project it was a challenging project because how do you design an identity for a community right a uh, community of 20 different uh, groups with their own crafts uh how it came about was um, there was going to be a show in japan at hankyu which is the second largest department store there i think this is about 3 years ago or 2 years ago 2018 and uh, they wanted an identity they wanted to educate the japanese public about crafts from kutch uh, because japanese audiences are familiar with rajasthani crafts but they are not familiar with crafts from kutch and so this is also by the way the largest exhibition of indian crafts in japan ever oh. um, so it was a massive show and so that's why they came up with the idea that you know we should have some sort of an identity to explain kutch to people and uh, the challenge was that you know as i said earlier like you know indian um, or maybe i didn't mention earlier but indian crafts and aesthetics is really about intricacy ornamentation and detail whereas if you look at type design or logo design it's the opposite it's minimal it's less is more it has to be simple um, you know and modular in some sense uh, and so that was a big challenge is like how do you make something rich and relevant to each community so they can understand that okay yes i am represented in this part of the identity so anyway we came up with the concept of a toran and the toran is uh, something that you know you um, uh, it kind of welcomes you it's an auspicious symbol it welcomes you to the house to the threshold um, and so that was the overarching symbol that we use and within the toran we put various embroideries like the you know the suf and kharek and uh, rabadi ahir as well as all the different uh, you know like you have ajak block printing and you have the uh bandhani tie and dye so you know and the weaves from uh, bhujodi so we try to in- incorporate all of them as patterns or as letters in this toran and uh, toran turned out to be interesting the concept of the toran because one is of course it is very relevant to gujarat the other is that in japan which we didn't know at this time but later found out um they have something called uh, tori t o r i i which is exactly like the toran um and oh, wow. it's a buddhist and shinto concept but it has come from india and uh, i mean okay. you may be aware that the toran actually originated in stone it was an architectural device like in sanchi stupa you have these torans ah yeah. oh so okay are, that, i didn't know that is a toran it's a gateway right so there mm-hmm. there are four torans in the four directions cardinal directions so you know when uh, buddhism went to japan i guess the same concept translated the tori there looks very different but it is still a gateway and so the idea was symbolic you know welcoming you to to kutch and so that's how we went about creating the identity but well, of course you have to see it to understand it much more but uh, yeah but it was very um, you guys can go on ishankhosla.com and you can look at all his projects like the 
uh, type craft initiative this kutch identity and everything um so how was it this is this is an identity for kutch like an entire region yes so how is it uh, different from maybe doing an identity for a brand or a company or something like that yes it's a good question i mean i think one of the challenges the is that each group has its own identity so you are doing a very complex identity where you are you are representing multiple identities within that identity and multiple um you know crafts and uh, you know they also each group has their own role in society some of them are like uh, you know uh, cattle herd cattle herders some of them are dyers mm. so there are different roles in that uh, communal setup and kutch is also the largest district in india so it, it also already has a lot of diversity so the challenge i think with a corporate identity and a, a place identity so this is like a place identity is you know place is much more intangible um it's also much more subjective um and it's it's your own emotion how you relate to that place as well and uh, you know whereas with a corporate identity there's a little more room for clarity and precision um and your message is very different your emotions are very different maybe if it's a car you're trying to sell uh, performance or speed or something like that a little more colder whereas with a place identity like kutch it's much more warmer much more fuzzier and uh, yeah so it's it's uh, and in this case it was also about the handmade it's about you know a lot of different uh, processes involved so we also did a physical identity in this case we made a physical tourn as well uh, with the different crafts which was a quite a challenge to do um but yeah i mean i mean i think the main distinction is that with a place identity and and an identity like kutch it's much more nuanced and uh, in a way tougher to to kind of pin down than than a corporate identity which has a vision and a mission and a much more clear clear uh, you know goal mm mm-hmm. uh, so with this kutch identity as you said you have a toran and uh, yeah. you have letters k u t c h on That's it right. uh, each done in a different craft so was the process for that the same as what you followed in the type craft initiative or was it a sort of different process? it was different uh, yeah it was very different because in this case what happened was we had to design the logo within a month um so we with type craft what we do is we always start with a craft workshop so we always start with crafts hand making uh and then we bring that back scan it digitize it here what we had to do is we had to go the other way around we we had to study the various crafts and then create a digital logo initially and then um, then the physical logo came later where we 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 went back to kutch and said okay this is the digital logo we created now we need to make uh, each of these in in the craft the respective craft so yeah it was a reversal uh, in this case because of time constraints okay um i just want to mention one thing here is that i've turned the comments off but if you have any questions uh you can ask it down below and near the end of the stream we'll try and answer your questions there's a place like there's a cards and question marks down there where you can ask a question and then i can see it uh later and uh, okay so continuing with the uh, kutch identity so this was supposed to be for an exhibition in japan right that's right that's right only in japan or would it be shown in like other places in the world no maybe? only or... in japan it was so it was an exhibition and sale so it was also a sale of works okay. but yes it was uh, okay. only in japan because it was sponsored by this organization by this company ah yeah so but japanese aesthetics are very different when it comes to you know uh, kutch the kutch aesthetic mm-hmm. so yes how did you keep that in mind you know as you're trying to market to a japanese audience no so we are we are selling kutch uh, it's not about japan as such i mean the idea was that uh, this could be adopted by the government of gujarat as a place identity of kutch eventually which could be used for tourism or at airports where you enter kutch you are welcomed or at a railway station uh, so tourism but it could also be used by the crafts people to sell their products as made in kutch you know so so it becomes like this kind of uh, gi in a way 
so i don't think the target audience should determine the identity you know so the identity comes from that community it remains the same if this exhibition mm-hmm. was to happen in america it will not change yeah okay yeah true okay. and um, so with that mm-hmm. we go to another project of yours which is called reexamining identity through the turban yes so could you tell us a little bit about that project yes um uh, so um i was basically commissioned by the devi art foundation uh, about 4 5 years ago it was a group textile exhibition um in delhi in gurgaon actually and uh, so the exhibition that i did was looking at uh, identity from a communal point of view uh, based on the indian man the male so i was looking at turbans um, because turbans for men like sarees for women represent an uh, the identity of where you belong to right what is your community what is your village what is your caste whether you're married or unmarried so various aspects of your communal uh, identity are represented in this turban um and i was playing on this idea of it was it's actually called the turban untied because uh, we don't wear the turban anymore and we it was actually looking at the unraveling of indian culture for in the in a sense uh, in the western way right so we are now wearing western clothes but 100 years ago we be wearing handmade uh, and hand woven uh, you know like clothing as well as turbans and so i so i was basically making a parody and a commentary on um, identity like communal identity indian identity but through brand through western brands so what i was basically trying to say in a nutshell was how we've gone from handmade uh, cloth and uh, you know which were like turbans and other cloth to uh, brands which like t- you know shirts which have logos you know which are mass produced uh like nike or puma whatever like these western brands that we wear mainly uh which are mass produced in countries like india ironically and then sold at a much higher price back to us um so i was referring to this idea of swadeshi which happened 100 years plus ago when british goods were burnt because indian goods were being taxed and then in this case what's happened is the reverse in a way where okay, it's not a tax but it's like a, some sort of a fine that we are paying a premium we're paying to to have that brand on our shirt and so what i did was in a nutshell again you have to see the you have to see the images to understand but in the turbans which are all handmade and hand print hand block printed um i embedded motifs um which look deceptively traditional and indian uh, like you would see a leheria you would see a buta dali jali these are all like indian turban motifs um leheria Uh, but what you when you go closer you will see actually the lehre is made of nike or the buta is made of puma you know or the chanel in there so there's this kind of parody and play happening and i was basically questioning what is this idea of identity right this tension between our individual identity and aspiration that we have um and a and a communal identity so that was the that was yeah the i agree with you that uh, it has to be seen uh, to yeah. understand exactly how like what a genius idea it is so if you guys is gone ishankhosla.com you'll be able to see all his projects including this turban one and uh, the you you really can't tell that they're made up of western logos if you see it from a distance yes so there's a, a lot of patterns in like very indian colors using indian techniques right block printing and yes everything. block printing they all done with block printing mm-hmm. hand block printing and they were hand carved so so that was again okay. furthering the contrast right because these are all mass produced garments and the products are mass produced but we are using hand methodologies yeah mm-hmm. um so did you like how did you decide on uh, what brands to use for that or was it just any like the popular brands which you see around you no so we were using uh, uh i chose to use cloth brands because it was all about clothing so turbans and so and and then wearing shirts and you know uh, basically garments so basically brands that are uh, western brands that people wear especially fake brands like you see a lot of playboy you see a lot of puma like people have playboy written on it, it has nothing to do with playboy but 
because it has the Playboy logo. I use that, and then I, you know, I basically also photograph a lot of you know on the street what people are wearing, and uh, that's been something I've been doing for many years. And this idea of fake brands, right? Uh, people who can't afford to buy a uh, like a premium Armani will wear a fake brand. So I was looking at which are these uh, logos that are used a lot by people on the street, uh, and uh, basically played with those. Yeah, so they're all cloth brands. Okay, and um, I was I was looking at an interview which you had done earlier, in which you said that which I found really interesting is how in our culture, it's the like the male clothing which started to become more westernized, whereas females like you mm-hmm. still see them wearing sarees and salwar kameez and all, but then you know men wear pants and shirts. Yeah. So. how do like should we do you think we should be wearing more of indian clothing or uh, how do we like how do we deal with this western influence is it a bad thing so you talk on men or women um uh, indian culture as a whole i would say <laughs> see i'm no one to judge uh, i don't uh-huh. think it's a bad thing or good thing or anyone anything like that um, i mean this project that i we just discussed was a more like it's supposed to be humorous but also it's supposed to make you think mm-hmm. um uh, yeah i mean it's individual choice i mean i won't judge anyone it's just that it's it's um kind of sad to see uh, some of the nice uh, you know block brands and indian uh, handmade clothings uh, disappear so like for instance my wife uh, uh, is an nid graduate surely but not that and she said that when she was in nid everyone was wearing block printed uh, you know gamtiwala fabrics and uh, uh, that was like very common but now when you go to nid it's not like that not only nid any college campus in general you don't wear hand people don't wear handmade clothing that much uh, so that's kind of sad in a way but it's also whatever the trends are right it's just that it's sad to see sometimes very cheap uh like i sometimes go you know in villages you sometimes see people wearing very cheap uh, synthetic clothing where they could have been wearing beautiful breathable cotton that's something that i feel sad but i'm no one to judge i mean it's also about affordability there are many other criteria it's also taste etc so it's very individual mm-hmm. yeah so i mean from what you said it um not just from what you said but like it sort of feels like uh somewhere some communities are losing their identity like losing all these crafts you know lost to time so how can we support indian crafts yeah i think as graphic designers uh i mean there's a there's so much we can do with indian crafts i feel this it's we're just touching the you know the iceberg so to say um and uh, like you could you can make it into a game like gamification can come into it you know ar we are like there's so much one can do to transform crafts through design through digital media um not just in the materiality but i mean i mean in in a graphic design manner and i think storytelling is another aspect the narrative tradition of india is so rich so there's so much that can be done even with animation and you know various media so i think not enough has been done and what i feel sad about is that okay things are going to disappear and then it would have been a lost opportunity so it's, it it would be nice for more people to and people are doing it but it'll be nice to see more interactions with crafts people uh to do such projects and it'd be i think i think the future is where a crafts person like a madhubani artist will actually be using a pen tablet not a not a pen and paper you know so they will also uh, get into this other kind of world there'll be kind of a synergy between design and craft that's what i'm hoping to see going forward i mean that would be that would be really interesting yeah hopefully we can uh, integrate more craft into our design in the future and have more indian influences yes. uh, indian so right now what i'm not just indian and other yeah definitely yeah. Yeah, yeah so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to turn on the comments and um, we have 10 minutes left so okay. i think we can interact with the chat right now so if you guys have any questions for ishan please type them below
do you have questions from before that you may have recorded them uh, may have kept or no uh no i'm sorry you didn't get any questions oh. all right well while people think about oh is there something uh yeah even though the initiative brings some exposure to the craft do you think cultural appropriation can become a problem yeah so appropriation in any form is a problem but i think in this case we are not appropriating so appropriation happens in my opinion when you are detached from that that person or that craft right here it is a synergy it's a symbiosis it, we are doing it together so in that sense is not an appropriation appropriation would be like i'm sitting in my studio here and making this z uh, or bar mein i play mm-hmm. totally on my own without any involvement of the community without their permission or any dialogue or discourse with them so that i yes i don't agree with appropriation but in a in a no. college scenario maybe it's okay but not not always not yeah mm-hmm. it's all about getting more involvement right into the project yeah. from from both ends Yeah it's about creating um, dialogue with people you usually don't speak to right i mean it's about people from cities going to villages people from villages coming to cities it's about breaking these barriers that uh, and that's one of the things we are trying to do as well are there any other okay. questions yeah the next question here is you have worked with um, you have worked with authorship in both academic and professional work how do you think design education and practice can integrate that better the idea of authorship mm-hmm. yeah i mean I sorry no sorry go ahead okay i mean it's not a very clear question how can design practice and uh, academia uh, integrate authorship uh, is that what you want to i think uh, elaborate on that question further so while while we uh, waiting for a move to elaborate on this question um yeah. what are some other projects you are working on right now if so you don't mind a, telling us yeah yeah of course not a problem <laughs> doing couple of book covers right now uh, so that should be fun. i mean uh, that's a lot of fun always and doing a website project uh, book design as well uh, like an art book design uh, and we are just about to start on the next type craft uh, project as i said in september but there's a lot of pre- preparatory work that has to be done mm-hmm. um yeah i'm also uh, going to be giving a talk at uh, type directors club uh, new york on zoom next month so i have to prepare for that like it will be a proper presentation on zoom so you know, mm-hmm. that's something that will be interesting to hopefully some of the viewers can come there come and check that out because there oh, is yeah, looking, something looking to at. take a look as look at as well uh yeah and doing a lot of writing as well i've been writing about uh, type and design and academia uh uh-huh. yeah oh, okay. oh we thing, have I another mention yeah, that i'm also working on a curriculum uh i can't mention where but it's a curriculum design project that i'm doing so which is uh, fantastic and exciting for a masters program is it uh, related to what you were doing in uh, in college in in uh, in new york yes you and no. you i mean yes education. it is related yeah it's related in the sense it is about design and it's about the indian context so that's basically where it is but uh, so here it is more about craft and design um, but it's a masters program so uh, okay yeah yeah so that's a very exciting right. thing to wait and see <laughs> yeah okay um okay so one question is how do you engage with these communities when they are already living on day to day livelihood so getting them on board and into their comfort zone yes good question um so usually we work with an ngo uh, who also helps us to decide what is fair in terms of payment and money monetary things uh, in terms of getting them comfortable that is what the whole workshop is about that's why workshops are usually one to two weeks because we spend quite a lot of time to just get them comfortable in working in this kind of scenario so what we do in the beginning we don't we don't go on day one and say hey now start making letters you know we say okay can you tell us about yourself tell us about your craft 
you know, uh, show us your motives, teach us. So we learn initially. And then uh, slowly we introduce them to, uh, we kind of, you know, persuade them, inspire them to try letters, you know, okay, now if you made this motive, how would you make this into a K? You know, how do you make this into another letter, right? Um, so that's how it starts. And then I think the ice breaks after two days. I mean, usually in our experience, people are, especially, you know, in small towns, villages, they're very warm and they open up very yeah. quickly, right? So it becomes easier then. The first day, and first day is very tough. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, I guess, ice to be broken. And that's why we start with something they're comfortable with rather than what we want to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did okay. Amor get back on um, his question? Uh, or? Yeah. Amor has elaborated on his question. He says, what I meant was, can we create can we create space for design authorship in Indian design academia and industry? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think there's a huge, which is what we started the whole talk with uh, in the beginning, was there's a huge need for uh, Indian identity and uh, you know, this idea of authorship, right? As an individual designer, what you stand for. I think uh, we are very influenced by trends and external design. I mean, what we're seeing around us, which of, obviously as designers, visual artists, we do get an influence. But the question then is, how do you find yourself in this world? I mean, in, in as an expressor. And again, the challenges in the, you know, graphic design is one of those professions where you are all the time a lot of the time working for a client where authorship becomes real, you know, challenging because you're dealing with their subjectivities and their viewpoints. And that's why it's important for mm -hmm. designers to do self-initiated work. I mean, Typecraft started out as totally self-funded, self-initiated. Touchwood today, we are getting funds, we're getting, uh, you know, visibility, but we're also getting funds to do projects, uh, which um, we, I never thought would happen, to be frank. It was just started something I started it to do something interesting rather than just do only uh, commercial work, right? And that's what I think I suggest to young designers is that to uh, to take a risk and make some time for your own self, you know? Um, money is not everything. I know in this time in COVID and all this money is very important, but uh, the soul is also important. So how do you balance that? That's something you guys will have to figure out. Okay. Oh, I have a question. Um, so this Typecraft initiative, uh, like who is funding it? Is it like the government or is it other companies? <laughs> no, no, it's not the government. I wish. <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> have, <laughs> so it's funded by uh, different organizations like uh, so Synergy Consulting is one of our clients. So it's actually a client of ours who, um, you know, the owner is from Gujarat. And so she got interested in uh, all our work that we're doing in Gujarat. So initially she was funding that and now we we're doing our, uh, a project outside Gujarat this year, but uh, also getting funding from them. So basically they cover the costs of, you know, um, our travel and the artisan's fees, the, the uh, whole scanning, the digitization. So it's it's not a, we're not making any money, but it's actually, at least it's covering the base costs of, uh, you know, working in that. Um, and, and then of course we have- It's a wonderful yeah. initiative, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then we have NGOs like Rang Sutra, which I'd like to shout, give a shout out to because they've also been really great. And we, the Barmer Applique has been done with their support and their help, where they, you know, provide, uh, they basically cover the costs of uh, a lot of the costs like travel and the crafts, uh, the craft person fees, the material costs, etc. So that's how we are able to do these projects. Okay. So we'll, we just have, I think, a minute or two left right now. So it's been an absolute honor to have you. It's been wonderful talking to you. Yeah, it's been and, great. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, do you have uh, any any message for the audience or for designers today? Oh, tough one. But I would say use this time to rethink design. I think uh, uh, we are you know, what, what this whole COVID situation has taught, at least me personally, is that it's kind of strange, you know, that the world, the, the planet is healing when we are sick, right? When humans are falling sick is when the earth is healing. Uh, so as designers, that should be a loud voice to...